so so yeah today um mostly uh, the biggest thing is you know i am a writer too um and so some of these skills is something that i've definitely applied to being a writer and a picture writer specifically um you know a lot of these observational techniques are some that things that you're going to apply in the woods but it can also be if, if you're interested in writing it's something you can apply when you're having conversations with people when you're um down in Harbor Springs um, when you're driving your car, those kind of things. And noting and being that kind of constant detective and that constant wonder of what's what's happening around you, what patterns you're seeing, what do they mean. Um, so it definitely can be applied in that way too. So I hope that you can take that, um, that bit as well. Yeah. Well, cool. So let's, uh, I'm gonna have you line up here and we're gonna try, um, I'm gonna teach you what's called owl vision. And so of course that's what we call it for our kids, um, but it's also something that um, it is a very much in, um, in taking the form of an owl. And this is a way where you're gonna more likely see things when you're out um, and detect movement and be able to be fully, more fully aware, have your head up when you're walking through the woods, et cetera. Um, and so before we, before we get in a line and we pick a point out in the woods in a second, I'll just say, um, if you're not familiar with owls, they have very different eyesight than we do. Um, somewhat uh, more enhanced, they can see at night better. Um, and they're actually, instead of balls like ours, we have eyeballs, they have eye tubes. They're more elongated tubes in their heads. Um, and it allows them to see at night. Um, they're mostly nocturnal. Um, but the other strange thing about them is they evolved to a point where their eyes outgrew the sockets of their head. And so they're actually fixed inside their head. So unlike us, we have this ability where we can you know, wander our eyes around, up, down, left, right, they can't do that. And that's why they sort of, you know, come up with this ability to go 270 degrees in each direction. Um, but they also do have bifocal lens, or bi binocular vision just like us, but it's a lot more limited than ours is. Um, they can still see depth and height, but in a smaller range. But what they can do, and what's so great about their vision, is they have this wider breadth. We have 180 degree peripheral vision, just about. Um, it's not, too, it's more 2D in certain parts, it's 3D in a certain focal range, but um, what they're so good at is detecting movement. Um, and so that's what I want to demonstrate for you today uh, for a moment here before we go out there. Um, and this is something that you can apply on a walk. This is something you might be able to apply while you're uh, looking at your bird feeder. Um, you're sitting outside and observing your garden before you plant. These are great times to, um, to see what's out there. Um, so let's, if we can, just line up maybe if possible, or even like a semicircle, maybe middle distance, wherever. Um, but a point on a tree, it could be a piece of lichen or a little mark on the tree. Um, but just focalize on that. And it's going to be really hard at first, just like meditation, where you want to keep your mind from wandering. Your eyes are going to keep wanting to break that focal point. Um, but, but try. Try to stay on that focal point for a moment. Um, and then if you can, I know some of you are wearing or have your, um, your trekking poles, but if you, if you feel comfortable enough to set them down for a second, I want you to put your hands out in front of you, wiggle these fingers, give you a little bit of an of a arm exercise, I'll, I'll be aware of <laughs> um, But wiggle those fingers um, and then slowly bring them to a point and still staring at that same point um, and bring them past that limit of your peripheral vision where you can no longer see them wiggling and then bring them just back in. And notice about how far from left to right, without moving those eyes, I see some of you are dodging. Keep those eyes straight. <laughs> um, if you can start, you can see, you know, from left to right, you have pretty good vision of movement from left to right, um, almost 180 degrees. Um, so you can, you can put your hands down for a second. Keep those eyes straight, though, if you can. Uh, find that focal point one more time. Um, and what's, the, you know, so right now, with that head up, you already have, you have a great extreme of something like uh, a squirrel, you know, potentially dodging from almost your exact 90 degree angle from you. Um, but the other great thing about it is you have your head up, you can also do it and do it in front of you now. Um, wiggle your fingers by your belt and just move them straight out in front of you, same kind of thing, um, out of your limit of vision and then just into it. And then right at that point, you can take a second break and look down you, that's pretty good. It's almost directly below you that you can still kind of note uh, movement, especially in front of you. Um, it's almost a step. For some of us, it might be two steps in front. Um, so when you get used to it and you practice this a little bit, you can you, know, you can more gen generally walk through the woods without having to keep your eyes down. We tend to do this kind of trail vision thing uh, when we're walking, right? It is a safer thing to do, and today we're mostly going to be okay with doing that. It's icy, but... Um, <laughs> But at times, I want you to try this at different times of your walk, where you can keep that head up and you can still observe your entire, a, big, a bigger portion of your world um, while still having a focal point and having that more relaxed owl vision. Um, and then the last one I'll have you do is right above your head, just to demonstrate above your head. Um, you know, bring it out of your limit and then just slightly into it. This one's, we're not as great um, top vision, uh, above vision as, as other things, mostly because our brows, they kind of higher. 
Um, but you can still see, um, especially further out, um, you can see almost to the top of a distant tree. Um, you can you can rest your hands now. Um, with, with, while still keeping your head straight forward and fixed like an owl. Um, so it's incredible what, you know, like our vision that we're usually um, so used to focusing, um, you know, doing dishes, reading, writing, doing our artwork, whatever it is. Uh, we tend to have this very focused and really great detail vision, um, but we tend to miss things if we're always in this kind of tunnel vision, especially in the woods. Um, so that is owl vision. That's something that we'll, we'll try a couple times in the woods. I might ask you like, okay, let's go into owl vision for a moment um, and see what we can see. Um, and so the, a good application of this, like I said, is just your daily walk. This could be while you're at the bird feeder, you can more likely see the hawk that's waiting to nab, or the titmouse that's on your feeder, et cetera. Um, and you're just gonna be generally more aware of what's in your purview. Um, so that's owl vision. Um, so this is essentially called fox walking. So the owl vision, we took the form of an owl. This one we're gonna try to take the form of a fox and it's more of a locomotive movement. Um, or it's a, that's, that's redundant, right? It's locomotion, but it's still an observational technique. But it's gonna allow us to essentially slow down and be quieter in the woods and have a more calm presence. Um, so essentially what it is, a fox can go through the woods without really setting off any alarms. Um, if you're not fully aware, um, oh, birds especially are kind of the alarm systems of the woods. You can hear them going off, chickadees, they're a very important one in, this, in these woods. Uh, juncos, you have juncos here, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a little chip, they sound like little pebbles clicking together when they go, that's their alarm. Um, but those are the ones, when you hear those and you hear that chick dee 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 and you hear it get really intense, and now these become more at the end, that's an alarm. They're telling, they're telling the rest of their game that there's something that they should be worried about. Um, and sometimes that's you. And if you are the one that trips that, you're less likely to see anything in those woods because everything's paying attention to that. From the fox to the deer to the possum, everything's really in tune with those, those alarms. So the best way to get through the woods without really tripping these alarms, um, and this is, a, again, this is an application just like owl vision, you're not gonna do the entire walk. Um, you're gonna do it maybe just in portions of your walk. Where I really like doing it is the cedar grove here. It just feels like a place you really wanna slow down. <laughs> Um, for those of you that are familiar. So we'll get there, we'll go there and maybe try this briefly if it's not too icy. But okay, so this is what I want you to try. Essentially, and maybe you've done this before. I know that this is natural if, you, if you've ever run across barefoot on like a hard surface or um, I know as a kid, if I go across gravel surfaces, you kind of pick up your feet and you kind of look like this and it hurts. Um, but you're naturally protecting your feet. And so even if you um, never really called it fox walking, you've probably done this before when you're barefoot. Um, but essentially what it is, um, you're gonna have a slightly narrower gait. Um, so pretend there's a rope got it between your legs. Um, slightly narrow gait, bend those knees just a little bit. Um, and this is gonna be weird because you have boots on, et cetera, but just try it with me. Um, but just go about six inches in front of you. And I want you to aim with that blade of your foot. And that's the outside, the pinky side of the foot. Um, and I want you to aim with that blade and just slowly move your weight onto your big toe. And then you're gonna let that heel go down. So what, what, how I've been taught is you, you, you imagine a tube of toothpaste uh, opened by your big toe and you're gonna squeeze out all that toothpaste and then slowly set down that heel. And then again, get that toe down and then the heel goes down that. And so it is gonna be painfully slow, <laughs> right? It might look like this. It might be about that slow. And that's actually a good place to be. Um, this is, you know, humans moving through the woods. It's a lot different. Um, then if you're slamming and you know you're making that pounding motion, crunching through snow. So we got we're just gonna look. You can you know over time you can get on a little bit, you go a little bit faster. Um, but the great thing about it is you can also stop at any point of that. So this is great for hunters if you're a stalker, um, if you're moving on a prey that you just shot. If you don't want to keep spooking it further, this is a great way to go through the woods. Um, but you get to slow down, take your time. Keep your head up and use owl vision while you're doing it because you're in a lot more balanced position. But you can also stop at almost any point during this. You can go back at almost any point because you tend to be in a more uh, strict balance um, as you're moving. So this is great if you tend to run into an animal, um, you know, a deer on the, on the trail, and you don't want to spook it away and you want to be able to observe it, you can stop, see it. Maybe you can bring your foot back slowly and stand more comfortably. But it's, it's a lot, it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot more, uh, comforting way to go about the world for those animals around you. And I always kind of tell my students who are 10 year olds, but just imagine you don't, you don't go into your, your friend's house and start by running in the door. 
You don't start by just like stomping into their kitchen, right? It's kind of the same thing. We're all visitors here to this place and it's kind of, fox walking is kind of a good way to start that walk. Um, so even if you don't do it through the whole thing, um, this is a good time um, when you're first beginning your walk, that first 40 yards in, it's good to kind of slowly eek in. And then you're less likely to trip those alarms. You're more likely to see wildlife um, without plowing them out of your way <laughs> as you're going, okay? So that's fox walking and owl hunting, okay? And we might try to apply these a little bit on our walk today at different times, but, um, but I kind of wanted to, from here on, just give you like a really, really small crash course into wildlife tracking in different ways you can look at a track and maybe not know at all what it is, but then you can make notes, go home, and then figure it out from there. Um, and so just give you the things that what you should be looking for um, is what we'll do too. So let's just get walking um, for a while here. Um, we're mostly, you know, you probably are familiar with deer. Um, we're probably mostly gonna see deer today, uh, more or less. But um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just kick on and uh, I'll stop us at a couple times when I see sign and so forth. I have a question, but Absolutely. So with coyotes and dogs, Yeah, yeah, good question. And it was actually the one I got wrong on my, <laughs> on my, on my uh, cert. So, um, yeah, so the biggest difference, um, the first big difference is, is the nails. Um, they're both going to register nails within the track, likely. Um, but it's the, what coyote, the biggest difference is coyotes have a thin, sharp nail. Um, and typically, domestic dogs have blunt nails. We tend to clip them, we trim them, we use Dremel tools on them. And so they're going to be blunter, and so they're going to look wider and bigger within that track, whereas a coyote might just look like a pen prick sometimes um, because they have sharper claws, right? They're, they're never being trimmed or anything like that. So that's usually the first big difference um, because uh, coyote and dog tracks, both, uh, both are symmetrical. Both have four, four toes. Um, they have four on both sides, um, just like... Uh, feline, etc., and they're both symmetrical. Um, and the other thing that um, distinguishes, I'll, I'll just say too, with between feline and canine, is there's uh, in the what we call it the white space or negative space of a track. You can see the toe pads, and then that space in between. Uh, canines have the X. They make an X between that that white space between the toes. Uh, cats, you'll have a C um, between the the lower lobes and the, the toe pads. And so with a domestic dog, that X is going to look even further out and wider set, um, because those toes tend to splay more. Um, they're probably bumbling around and they're, they're less athletic looking. Um, but the other thing too, is that the coyotes, the other difference is the toe pads all tend to be a little bit tighter into the set. Um, um, but the, the, especially the rear, um, pad of a coyote, um, they have, um, basically like two toes and then two down or two pads and then two pads here. And the rear, they're almost in line with each other. It's kind of strange, but they're almost, uh, all the toes almost seem to be on a, on a similar plane with coyote. So if you find a heel, uh, especially a rear track of a coyote, you'll see that those toes kind of really bunch together. And that's another way to tell a difference. But generally the nails is the, is the key factor. Well, cool, so, um, so, you know, tracks is a little bit of what we're talking about today, but the other thing that, um, you know, is their sign, right? Then we also have a lot of different ways we're gonna see animal signs throughout the woods. And so, that might be a woodpecker hole, like the one that's uh, right there. Likely um, a hairy started and a downy went into it, but right next to Bill here. Um, and then we got this interesting thing happening to this red pine tree. Um, and um, so part of the owl vision thing too is not so much just um, being able to see movement, but you're also probably more likely to see uh, disruptions in the baseline. So. What I mean by that is, you know, a red pine normally doesn't have like this entire rip out of it, right? But you would be able to notice as you're walking with your eyes up, you'll, your eyes will also catch those little, those little breaks, those little moments where the tree doesn't look quite right. Um, so here, um, I, I just, I was, this, these are my tracks from yesterday, going up to the sky. Uh, what's a couple things you notice about it right away, um, about this tree? Besides it being a red pine. It looks like there's been an axe or some kind of chainsaw perhaps right there where the star is. Right, yeah, there's like, there's a few marks. And it's very, right, very straight, very flat, very human. Um, yeah, it kind of does look like chainsaw, like they're about to do the smiley face thing before they cut it down. Mm -hmm. I kind of, there has to be an interesting story about that, right? Like it's still standing, but. Yeah. Um, um, and then we also have this huge rip uh, going up the front of it. Um, and we also have it kind of overgrown on either side. Um, so it's, that's definitely very old, we could say, you know years old um the, the the tree you know normally if you know obviously this didn't happen recently but that tree would be yellow we would it would still be yellow if it was like oh, less than a year old once the sap starts running things start turning brown so that's one way you can age tree marks um 
and we'll see uh, a little bit later on a tree that's been recently uh, drilled by a porcupine and you can see what that bark would look like differently if it happened recently. Um, and so, yep, we definitely have some chainsaw marks. Um, you know, you kind of wonder that rip um, things in the woods that can do that besides um, an animal is a tree falling and stripping that bark down, right? So that that's the other thing. Like we can't always just assume every mark is an animal um, or even non-human animal. Um, but if you get closer to it, um, there's uh, and it, uh, you can individually walk up, but there's these little um, acorns uh, broken up and in, in, in placed into those little those gashes into it. Um, and then if you go on the back side, you'll also see um, a little bit difference going on in the bark. So if you want to take take turns going up and just kind of looking at it and just observing it and kind of tell me what you see um, when you look at it um, going, especially on the back side of it, um, if, you, if you want to go on a time. Uh, what kind of stuff were you seeing on that, especially that back side? Um, what was different than the front of the tree on the bark? There's some lichen growing on that yeah. side, close to the lake. There's a groove on the back side. There's a groove, like a ridge going yeah. up it? Yeah. How about the bark itself? Like, does the bark itself look like it's been... It's more, it's more uh, cut up. Right? It's more cut up, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, those are, that's our tree road in front on that other side. This is, this is frequented, um, so, like, we'd see trails on the ground up here and stuff. That's, a, that's a trail mark of this squirrel. That's, <laughs> that scratches you see going up the back, that's, that's a, a frequented run of the squirrel, uh, going up there. Um, and so it's really interesting, I mean, we'll see it, it's such, that's a really good, uh, another good sign of it. There's a cedar tree up ahead, um, that has a real, it, cedar trees really show the squirrel runs. Um, but they, it's just, it's especially in the beginning, they tend to scratch a lot at the base and then they can kind of kick up. And so part of that, we, we also think that it could be scent marking as well. They have, just like we do, we have some scent, mar um, scent glands in our hands and deer do every, about everything does. Um, and so part of that is maybe a territorial thing of making sure they get a good mark scent as they're going up and then they can scurry up and do what they need to do up there. There's no snow in places, right? <laughs> what, 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 what tree are we looking at? Hemlock. hemlock, right? Yeah, we got hemlocks, and that's kind of the sure sign. Like, if you're going through the woods in general, um, you know, in the winter, you don't see snow on the ground, you're probably looking at a hemlock. They're so good at catching snow, and this is often a place where deer are going to bed down. Sure. Is um, This is where not exactly. only uh, is it clear and from ice and snow, um, but they also eat hemlock, um, and I was watching them do it this uh just recently, and I think I, I told some of this story, but of watching them, and it, and it comes, they put their butt from the base of the tree and then aim their head up and then pull straight down on the bow and pull needles mm -hmm. off. And it's kind of a vitamin fix more than anything. It's not really that that much in carbs or anything for them, but I think it's a vitamin fix at this time of year for them. Um, but they were pulling it down and this huge load of snow came right onto his face. Um, <laughs> and so it was pretty great. It just kind of shook it off. I think it was a year like too. It was just a, a cute moment, but, um, so what's so great when you come into these little places here, um, I'm not going to have us necessarily all walk there, um, but I've been back there a few times and this is definitely a bedding spot for deer. There's a lot of what you'll see in bedding um, spots besides sometimes even depressions, they tend to reuse them and use them as little napping places. Uh, sometimes they're overnight and then you'll really see a groove, uh, which would look like, you know, like maybe like the size of your dog would lay in, but it kind of a U shaped or a C shape. Yeah. Um, and you'll definitely find a lot of scat in that same spot, um, in different age that, scat. Yeah. You'll see, you know, especially if it's a frequented bed, you'll see fresh scat or you'll see stuff that looks like it could fall apart in your hand. Um, so that's the time, that's when you know that you're at a bed that's been frequented um, and interested in woodpecker. Yeah. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting spot. And uh, I recommend when you're, you know, you're here maybe in a smaller group to kind of kick around and check out what kind of sign you might see. Um, especially in these moments in the in the in the tree uh, where you have a broken, um, you know, no snow on the ground, and of course, like when it's not winter, you won't really see that as well. So this is a great time to kind of be be noting these kind of differences. Um, in the, it's in the a tree. large group of deer that uh, fed down here. Yeah. When I walk this trail, I'm amazed that you know there'll be 20 deer go flying up that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a place for them at some point in the day. I'm not sure if it's a you know nighttime, daytime. Um, thing. Cause they tend to be crispuscular. Does anybody know what that means, crispuscular? That is a new one. Kind of a weird term. It basically means, so there's there's diurnal, which means they're active during the daytime, um, like us. Um, there's nocturnal, which means active at night. And crispuscular is active during twilight. 
Um, so those times, like the blue hour, just just as this, it's usually before the sun is really out, but you can still see. Um, so that might be called the blue hour as well. But that's when deer are most active, generally. Um, so you might see them kicking around during the day. Like when I saw that them feeding at Hemlock, that happened to be during the day. Um, but you will see beds that are kind of those little in-between spots. Um, I would think at night, generally, around here, they would probably be more like at a hillside, a place where they could see out. So if they do hear alarms during the night, they can have a clear idea of what's going on and they can kick out of there. Um, I don't think that they would necessarily be in a goalie at night, <laughs> in a place that's probably easier to be attacked and so forth. Um, so they like the high ground. Typically, yeah, especially in a time when they're going to be napping or, or sleeping for a longer period, generally speaking. Um, How does their alarm work? Their, the deer alarm, yeah. they don't necessarily alarm themselves, um, but they do hear, they listen for other things. But the one thing that they do is their tails. And we're all kind of familiar seeing the white, you know, the, especially white tails. They're a really good job of flagging their tails. When you see that tail go up and you're near them, they're typically warning the folks around them what's going on. They also, they, they've done studies of their democratic deer are, and they lift their head a certain way. And when they look, if you keep watching them, they tend to look a certain direction every time they lift their head. And then eventually they tend to vote and it's kind of their way of voting and going that direction. So they are communicating in different ways, but it's more physical than it is, um, than it is vocal. And they also, they also set mark a lot. And that's what you're seeing with buck rubs, which we, I think, I think we'll find a buck rub today. Um, where they use their antlers and mostly we you know you hear of that as being stripping off the velvet and it may be itchy and that might also be true but they do have glands on their heads um, and they're and they're also marking and, and marking their territory essentially is what's happening um, so you'll see that a lot especially during the rut in the fall um, in the springtime it'll be um, yeah this is it, we're getting close to uh, I think it's like April through July around here when they start having their kids which might be twins this year because at least that it's talking to Jerry and uh, um, Patsy yesterday about that, about um, how, how this has been kind of a mild winter. So they might actually be having quite a few. So you might see in a lot of, a lot of fawns kicking around in the summer. Um, cool. Um, so anyway, hemlock's great. Um, one thing to note about them, and I, Bill actually, you told me about this, is that they're all kind of, there's a chance that a lot of them might be going away um, because of the uh, woolly hemlock adelgid. Um, and it's a little insect that's starting to infect some of the trees around here. So it's something to keep note. And as little as citizen scientists, I almost said little. See, that's my 10-year-old, the 10-year-old <laughs> talk. Um, as citizen scientists of the area, um, you know, you can start noting and maybe start seeing um, what's going to look like little waxy or fuzzy white stuff on the, on the uh, base of the, the boughs of these hemlocks. Something to note and let people know, because as I'm already telling you, hemlocks are really important to deer species and a lot of other species. And not to mention they're great to look at, but um, it, once these start going, I think the winter behavior of deer is gonna change dramatically, especially in a region like this. So um, something to keep note of. I mean, not to, not to bring down the house, you know, or <laughs> make it sad, but just something that you, you can have a hand in maybe mitigating if we catch it soon. So we got a couple and on this side too. What do you suppose that is? There's a potential of a couple things. So I was staring at this guy for a long time. These are my footprints around this. And I was trying to find more, more of it. Um, this is likely climbing behavior of something um, with four claws. Um, there's a couple things that could be in that case. Um, we have porcupine that are huge climbers here and tend to do that. But I wouldn't think that they would be, um, their scratches are a little bit, don't get that long. They're not heavy, you know, so they... Yeah. And these ones are kind of strange right here, right? Because it kind of it kind of bunches together and then spreads out. Um, we also have one here. And then if you keep looking up, you keep seeing these little marks going up into the tree. Um, and at first I was kind of like, well, that could have been a tree that fell on it. But we do have this branch here that looks pretty old. Um, I feel like that branch would have came off with something falling and skidding down the tree. Yeah. So we can maybe take that out, um, deduce that it's not something that fell and scraped. Um, and then, yeah, we have also um, on the back side here, we have what looks to be something like feeding sign or a kind of marking. Um, a lot of animals in the winter um, eat what's called the cambium or the living, um, the living portion of the tree, which is just inside the bark. Um, so deer tend to eat them and that's about at the right height for a deer. Um, but bear also do that. Um, they tend to go a little bit like if they're going to go for it, they really go for it sometimes. Um, so if you see if that's a bear, then it would, that would be more of a, a territorial marking, um, something where they're not necessarily feeding, uh, <laughs> but more of like we're marking this tree. This is an important tree for our path. 
Um, and then we have these these scrapes that, to me, and um, of course, it, it's so. That it, well, first thing to note is that the age, you know, like I said before, if you start seeing yellow marks on a tree, that's probably pretty young, uh, within you know, like within the last seven months or so, or maybe a year, um, before the sap starts running again. Um, probably by midsummer or maybe later next year, you'll see that turn brown. Um, so we know that those are a little bit newer. Um, we know that the, the bear have been hibernating, but they were up probably in November, right? Right before they start bedding down. So there's a chance that that could be a bear. Um, that could be a bear that marked. Um, and what I think is happening here is this could have been a tree that they used to climb, potentially. Um, what do you make of the distance between the claws here? And that's kind of the thing, right? Like the um, bears, they, they almost have uh, black bears. You get, that's, that's what it would be. It wouldn't be a grizzly run, yeah. obviously. Right. Uh, black bear is almost at the width of our palm, just about for the four, maybe just a little bit wider. And so if it's if it's almost keen for you, or like if it almost fits a human, then you almost fits a bear, um, just about. But their nails do tend to turn in and tend to bend, so it might look smaller than what they actually are. Um, that would be my guess. I don't have 100%, I can't say 100% that that's bear, um, but I will say that it's li very likely not bobcat. Um, they also do scratch posts, but it's very rare to find them, um, especially vertically. They tend to do it more like on these kind of guys, um, the fallen trees. Um, so there's a chance that it's bare. Um, and it could have been a climbing tree. Um, sometimes they can climb without ever making marks. They're really, really strong. They have huge, uh, powerful upper body. And then their legs on the front, they almost put them flat. And then they kind of do this and then kind of skid their feet up. And they don't, maybe don't have to scratch as much. But, um, but if this is a marking tree, then they might mark just like the squirrels a little bit sooner. Um, and then what we got there, maybe. What you notice about it, I guess. Where are we looking at? I see, uh, this uh, hole here, we have some kicked up matter on it. Like, uh, Somebody digging course. for acorns or something? Yeah, it must be, right? Um, probably a smaller animal, right? That's not, likely not a dog that bound it up there and kicked it up. So yeah, that's that's probably more like a chipmunk or um, or a squirrel. I have seen chipmunks waking up. They do hibernate, uh, maybe you know. Um, but they tend to wake up like those days where you all were tapping trees. The chipmunks are waking up because it's warmer and come out. So that could also potentially, but my, more likely, yeah, a squirrel going and finding an old nut. So squirrels don't hibernate? Squirrels do not. Nope. Um, typically. Um, but chipmunks do. They're, uh, but they, they're, they're not quite like bears where they can go for a huge stretch of six months or whatever. They have to wake up every few days and oh. eat. Sometimes they have a nice nest where they have like little food with them so they can eat in their nest. But... Man, I saw one come out there the other day on the hillside behind the house at Goodhart and or the residency, and it was looked emaciated. It was just this little. I've never seen a chipmunk look so sad because usually I'm used to seeing them like kind of you know plump and happy, but it just like yeah, it definitely just woke up. It looked pretty sad. So there's a potential. You might be seeing that more often right now, especially. Um, but it could be potentially a chipmunk. Um, and one way to tell, and you can't really, the, the tracks are long gone now, but is would be the size of, and the width of the trail that's leaving it. Um, you know, smaller width, obviously chipmunk, a little bit wider, probably eastern gray squirrel here. Um, but another thing to note, right, food. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's them trying real quickly. We can't really tell. These are a little bit older, probably a few days ago before the snow really started melting. These were registered in the substrate. Um, and the substrate is what we call the whatever medium something's running on. So sand, dirt, road, in this case snow, um, that would be the substrate. But what, what can you tell about these ones a little bit? Um, you know, something different than... We didn't look at the other deer tracks, but what, what would you note that's a little bit different about these? Um, they're more, uh, they're wider. Wider set, yeah, between that group set. It's yeah. definitely wider. Um, what else, anything else? They're not all lined up, they're in different patches. They're oh, four did patches. you hear that? It's a saw. It's a chainsaw. It was? Chainsaw. <laughs> It's a wild chainsaw. It's a wild <laughs> chainsaw here, yeah. You never know what you're going to hear in Good Heart, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, they're more grouped together. There's a large spacing between the group sets. Um, the stride, so we'd call that the stride length from the high, uh, from the, uh, the closest one to the next one in line here. Um, and so normally you would, if, you know, if you could tell the difference between the hind and the front, which would be, you know, you can kind of tell this because I know this is a gallop, um, oh, okay. a gallop mark. Um, but they tend, gallops tend to have this sort of sheep, like C shape here. And just like, uh, ra uh, excuse me, rabbits, rabbits, when they bound, they go front feet and then their hind legs follow. And so when you're watching a rabbit, this is not a rabbit, by the way. <laughs> uh, but you'll see uh, the hind legs will be in the straight line together. And then you'll have 
their, their front feet, and it'll kind of look like that. Um, and the direction that would be traveling is that way, because it's going hind legs in front and running. And this similar thing with galloping, it's not the same thing. This is a deer and gallop. Um, and gallop is what you would maybe notice with horses or whatever, you know, this is when they're moving quickly. Um, so that's the big difference. And what you noted, yes, that's the big thing first to note is how wide set they are, um, how, how much distance is between them. They're really moving through this space. Um, and so that's something to notice. That's a difference in baseline, right? A baseline for a deer, as we've been seeing for most of this, and I didn't really know it, but they're just kind of walking. And they're doing their thing, taking their time, doing their impression of fox walking. But this is, they got scared and they're getting kicked off and they're probably not running on their main artery. It looks like they're going on a place that they probably normally wouldn't go. Um, you don't see many other deer tracks near it. Um, so something happened here, something spooked it. Maybe human, maybe a dog, who knows. Um, but that's something to note, is just this, you know, like looking at the trail and noting that you can kind of interpret based on things like its stride length, um, based on what its gait looks like, how wide it is. Um, this is a quick rule of thumb. The tighter the gait, the faster it's moving. So what I mean by that is, you know, the, the width between the, the feet um, that you see in the print. Um, so I'll make my little human marks here. Um, so this is my, my gait width here from that edge of my foot to that edge of my foot. When humans run, we tend to tighten that gait too, right? And we tend to run more on our toes and that gait gets tighter. And it's the same thing with all animals. The faster they move, that, the tighter that trail is gonna look, that width. Um, and then it also gets bigger between stride lines. So, um, so it's kind of, that's one, one easy way to start interpreting what's happening around you. Um, we, know, you know, we, can, we know that this animal is moving faster than its normal baseline. And we know that something likely spooked it and it's going this direction. <laughs> so something over there scared it this way. And so that's kind of the fascinating thing about tracking to me is not just, and this is what I kind of want to leave, like, well, we have a little bit of a walk, but one of the things I want to leave you with is that um, it's the, you know, try to get pushed past that, that place of just identifying and being okay with knowing what it is. Walking by and being like, oh, there's a deer. Oh, there's a squirrel. I know these guys. It's more what, what I want you to get to is this place where you start interpreting. What can, we, what can we say about what, what's different about this trail than other trails around, et cetera. And that's kind of when you start getting into that detective, that like uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, mindset of the woods. So, um, so that's something to note. This is a difference in baseline right here. Um, a walk by a deer here. Okay. And so one of the things that we're talking about is, uh, can you mind me your name? Denise, Denise was saying we can also see a little bit of dragging, a little bit more of a leisurely <laughs> movement. Um, we're pushing into, into the snow like this, right? We can see that from here, that's their, their dew claws and stuff are registering on the backside of that trail going in. Um, and they're kind of walking. This is a slower movement. The strides are closer together. They're a little bit wider apart. Um, so yeah, this is more of a baseline. Um, they feel safe. They feel safe, yep. This is a normal movement for them. Um, so we have another break in baseline here. Um, what I first noticed when I was walking through is more of what we're seeing here, this kind of shedding on the ground. Um, so that's, especially oh in the snow, gosh. it's easier to tell. Um, we have some, something happening up there. Uh, any, uh, any possibilities or what, what are you noticing about it? Um, Woodpecker or something or what? Porcupine? porcupine. Is it porcupine? Yeah, that would... That's my guess, yeah. And what? And how long ago would you say, just based on looking Very at it? Very recent, yeah. It's winter. Yeah. yeah. So it could be, could have been, you know, in the last few weeks. Um, yeah. We we noticed that at at Woolham, there was a ton of trees like this at Woolham. Yeah. And I think a lot of them were maple trees, and I don't know if they like the sweet. I that, don't know. That you know? could be it. Um, they tend to go, and they tend to just go up really high. Um, that's, that tends to be where the, the bark is thinner and sweeter, easier to eat. Um, it's easier to get to, the cambium. Um, that's, the again, the living layer inside the bark. Um, and that's what they're feeding on. And yeah, so you'll see it up high. And then often if you find one, you'll find one nearby. And if you all turn around for a second, and um, if you want to use your owl vision. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got another one right there. Um, that can't do the tree any favor. Not at all. No. <laughs> no. So it kind of seems, I think they yeah. girdle. Yeah. Girdling means it, it cut out all the living layer, at least around one section of the tree, um, which will kill it. Um, so a lot of loggers don't like porcupines, and it's because they tend to do this. But hey, they got to eat too, right? It's gotta, <laughs> I feel. 
Um, so yeah, they're expert climbers. They tend to sleep in trees um, and they tend to do this to trees. And like you said, maple, that's a, that's a good note. Maybe maybe more so interested in maple or like those kind of hardwoods around uh -huh. here, um, potentially. Um, but yeah, I was kind of trying to find, I didn't really see, you can often, um, if you, you know, you find this right when it happened, you could find a little place where it kicks down. Um, and porcupines, I think, have the cutest prints of all time. They look like little baby feet. They're plantigrade with us, like us. That means all their, they, they basically walk on their, their, uh, their heels and their pads. Um, they fuse together like ours have um, on our feet. Um, and they look like baby feet and they're kind of pigeon toed <laughs> and they walk like this and they have really long nails. So you'll see what look like baby feet without the toes and then really long uh, pen pricks of nails um, going. And then often you see their big tail kind of disrupting it. And it almost looks like if you ever, especially in the dunes, it looks really interesting. It looks like a big snake um, has gone through and it's because of that big tail. I know they've got a swagger. You know, yeah. they're, they're not impressed by no. people. <laughs> no, and it's because they don't have any predators. Right. They can just chill. I mean, really in this area, and something I noted, but I don't know, again, another thing I can't positively identify, but fisher um, are the one thing that will eat them. Uh, gray foxes are also predate on them, but I don't know that we have those up here. Um, those are both things that can climb and have also. How do, how do they eat them? <laughs> so apparently they knock them on their back. They have a good way of knocking them on their back and then they attack their belly where it's not um, full of quills. Um, but there are fisher up here apparently, um, and it, they've had a rebound. Um, What's I, I'm a sorry, fisher? What, yeah, what I, is a fisher? Thank you. Yeah, so, <laughs> and so on like a mink or something that's more um, riparian and, and lives on rivers and creek beds and otters that tend to be that, they're more uh, uh, evolved to, to live in, in woods. Um, and they actually, fishers can move their, their hips, their <laughs> really loose hips, and they can move them almost 180 degrees behind them. And you can see them run down trees head first. Um, and there's not many things on earth that can run head first down a tree besides a squirrel um, and a couple other things. Um, and they can do that because they can turn their hips out wide and run down. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes them really agile. They're like one of the craziest hunters. They can swim, they can climb, they can jump, they can tunnel, they can, yeah, they're insane. I think the weasels are the coolest. Yeah. <laughs> um, the mustelids, they call them. So um, but they would predate on this. So keep an eye out. I don't know about here in Wollum. I think I saw a two by two bound, which is the common uh, trail for a weasel um in oh. snow and i saw him uh going at the base of one tree to the next where the porcupine had been um so something to keep an eye on i don't know maybe a fisher yeah. would make it down here um so is this a winter behavior because we we first noticed it in january at willem and it was fresh like the 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 chips like four to four inch chi like strips yeah were super fresh in january yeah yeah, I think it would definitely be a behavior you would see um, in, in the winter, but they do do it, I think, year round because okay. it is their main, like one of the main ways they main feed, food. but they also do it on branches and um, they eat, you know, some foliage too. Um, so okay. I would say like doing this kind of thing, like stripping in one hole is probably more of a winter yeah. behavior. It's just, um, talk about observation though. We, we walk through here a lot. I didn't notice it here. <laughs> like didn't, didn't see it. So yeah, that's the... That's the owl vision. Yeah, you, know, I you get to see vision. that little disruption up there. Um, oh yeah, well, yeah, Casey, yeah. the big one. Oh that, yeah, wow. So there's a guy. He's he's around here, and uh, <laughs> you might want to you just keep your eye out. Um, you might see him kicking around. Yeah. And then so the so someone said maybe woodpecker, and that's not necessarily a bad guess either. But what, what woodpecker would do, it would come in after this, maybe the next season, and then start drilling holes into that that bark that's already exposed for them. Um, so they're really they're really ta in tandem with you're talking about. Can you remember your name, mm -hmm. Susan? You're saying um, about um, succession and things maybe falling through that. You know that would be a natural succession is a porcupine shredding something and then woodpeckers taking it down slowly uh, <laughs> and then it, then you start seeing more of this action um, in a natural way um, It's actually a pretty stable way of walking. You feel pretty balanced because you're taking your time. You exactly, know? right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's slightly safer. And in, in, in pairing it with the owl eyes, you know, you're moving at a pace, like you said, you're balanced enough to where if you feel like you're about to hit something, you can move that foot. It's still moving yeah. through, you know, so really have to move down. Um, so this is a great way to stalk things, especially if you want to get closer to wildlife and see them. I've seen deer, and especially on this spot. I'm sure they're over here too, but... 
um, if you want to go get close to them, that's, that's about the pace you have to go. Um, you have to be really intentional about your movements and, and what you're stepping on, how you're moving. Um, but it is a really great way to connect and be a little bit closer and understand some of the behaviors more. And you can see them happen in real time. You can see them dropping snow on their face and so forth. And then get out there um, because you're 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 that that quiet visitor. You're not that loud visitor um, going into these areas. So just something to try. Again, this isn't maybe maybe you're not going to do your entire walk like that, right? You got places to be. Um, but maybe just like in this section, for instance, you could try this box walk in this owl vision. Um, awesome scat. Um, this little guy on the ground. Um, we don't have too much other signs, so the first thing you would do um, when you see scat, I mean, maybe you can identify it by just looking at it. Um, <laughs> but um, but you would maybe look for tracks or other other things around it that can also give you clues of what it is. Um, but you can also just note there's some fur in it. Um, it's a little bit denser, um, and it also has this look that's kind of twisted. So if you want to look at it, um, maybe you could see those kind of features in it. Um, but just uh, take a look real quick if, if you want. You don't have to smell it and get your hit. <laughs> I have an idea. Yeah. Um, not seeing. Yeah. Just a couple of them, right? Might have unloaded further out. Um, but yeah, this is uh, this is likely coyote. Um, oh, is that right? Yeah, coyote uh, tend to have this kind of twisted look to them, a tapered end to them. Uh, the difference between canine and feline generally is a blunt end um, for cats. They're kind of blunt, they always call them like cigars, <laughs> and they're kind of stuck together, and they tend to be a lot denser. Um, the other big difference, um, besides like a domestic dog, um, is you might still see a tapered look like that. Um, but there's fur in this. Um, I don't know about your dogs, but not many of them hunt and catch things um, and eat. <laughs> things with fur, it's possible. Um, but it's also a little bit denser. It doesn't have that kind of what you're probably used to, um, that kind of like brown, uh, consistent look, yeah. right? So this one was uh, recently fed. It's kind of what it looks like to me, yeah. Um, and it's relatively fresh too. But this is a little one. I mean, usually you would see more than that. Um, so this could be, you know, kind of spooked in the middle of what it was doing. <laughs> um, it took off, but that, that's my best guess is probably coyote. Um, yeah, and that would be the way to tell the difference too, is that brown, like you, I mean, for those of you that have dogs, I mean, you know what dog food uh, scat looks like. <laughs> this, is, this is a little different from that. Um, we have different different species uh, going at this one. Um, you know, the rounder ones, we tend to have more of the hairy woodpecker or the smaller downy. Um, and downy usually comes in and kind of comes in after one's already been there because they're a little bit smaller, a little bit weaker. Um, and then on this side we have, um, it's kind of a very common look, uh, almost rectangular look of uh, pileated on this side. Um, and maybe a little bit on that side too. And That's, they're like the sawmill when they get going. Oh yeah, it's, it's crazy. Flying. Yeah, huge so, birds. Um, so Harry and Downey do the more, like I see like one inch, like a one inch diameter round. Yeah, okay. yeah that would be more Harry or Downey, yeah. Um, what about hollow trees and raccoons? Is that in general where they, like we've seen Hollow trees at the top Look like at this, this and the raccoons going. being right down in there. Down in it, yeah. <laughs> this is about right. Yeah. right they like tend to nest in chimneys too, if you're not careful. <laughs> I yeah. think it's I think it's kind of their natural look, yeah. Okay. Hollow trees or hollowed out logs, that kind of thing. Um, and the cool thing about these two, not probably not necessarily here, but um, other bird species like chickadees, titmouse, um, they tend to nest in woodpecker holes. Um, they can excavate softer wood like this um, themselves, but generally, um, why bother? Yeah, why bother exactly? So they might move in, and you might um, see them. And they, I think chickadees are some of the cutest things, but they tend to pig pile on each other at night, and they might get in these more massive holes and then pig pile and get up in this like big bundle so they could stay warm. Um, but I don't, I don't know about titmouse if they do that too, if they're more individualistic. But um, yeah. So this is something to note. You might you might every once in a while see chickadee or something shooting out of a hole like that. Um, and it's called it's called a sit spot, and it's something that um, we we had to do every day while I was at Alderleaf. Um, and essentially, it's it is what it sounds like. Um, and be going finding a, the same place every day to go and sit and just be quiet and sit like an owl and just view the world, um, see what's around you. Um, and you might journal, and that's part of it too, is journaling and mapping what's around you. And the idea is, is that if you can learn what's in that 30 foot radius over time, it, you can then understand better of what else is out there. Um, and so you might not know all the tree species when you first sit down. You might not know all the tracks when you first sit down. Um, you might not know all the birds that are coming through. 
Um, but when you do it throughout the year, you also notice the pattern changing. You'll see different kinds of birds coming. You'll see the trees changing, etc. Um, so it basically just a, it's just a 15 minute thing you might do in the morning or whenever it's easy for you. Um, it, by your garden is a good place to do it yeah. too, because then you're also observing what kind of things are interacting with your garden. Um, you can note if it's skunks that are coming in and eating your lettuce versus rabbits, etc. Um, but it'd just be 15 minutes um, getting into owl vision if you can and do your best to stay in it as long as possible. And then you're more likely to catch things in your peripherals um, and just being still and quiet. And it's something that's really hard, especially for kids and something that I always make them do at the end of this kind of thing and be like, OK, you're going to go sit for 10 minutes and we're going to come back and talk about it. we're not going to do that today. But um, that's a challenge. You give yourself, you know, maybe just do it uh, once a week um, and then maybe try doing it um, every other day. Um, and it's a really good practice to get to do about every day. And you can think of it as a meditation in a way, too. Yeah. Um, if you tend to meditate, it almost it, you're going to feel that kind of jelly, <laughs> kind of jelly like at the end of it. Um, but what I kind of want to pass on to you, too, is not so much that you need to learn everything and know it and identify it. But it's that you can you can learn by just seeing and observing and, and deducing. You know enough. You know what animals are around here. You know what's going on. You can deduce um, what's happening around you just by observing and, and asking questions. So. Um, yeah, don't bring your, that's, this is not a place to bring your field guide. Get home and look at your notes and then you can, you can start figuring out, but.